Hi everyone, and welcome to Eric's Electronics Workbench and part two of the ICO Model 1030 Regulated Power Supply Restoration. Now if you haven't seen part one, I'll put a link to that video directly below in the description. So let's continue. So as we have the power supply turned upside down to do the restoration work and gain access to the bottom of the chassis, you can see I have three of the vacuum tubes removed. So I have the two 6L6s and the five AR4 rectifier taken out. Those tubes install in this back corner of the chassis, but they extend too far down and would interfere with the workbench surface when the power supply is turned upside down. So right now the power supply is resting on the top of the transformer and the top edge of the front panel. Now, the last thing we want to do is break one of these tubes by having it uh, have any weight on it while the power supply is upside down. We don't want it acting as a support on the corner of the chassis. But the other vacuum tubes are still installed, so you can see I can run my hand underneath here and there's no clearance issue whatsoever. Even if the chassis tips down, those vacuum tubes don't touch the workbench. Now it's perfectly fine to leave the vacuum tubes in the sockets while you're soldering or desoldering on those sockets. I've done that for many years, no issues whatsoever leaving those uh, in the socket while you're doing that work. Of course you want to be using an appropriate sized and appropriate rated soldering iron to do that type of work. If you're coming in here with a you know, 200 watt soldering gun, you're going to be causing some damage, but uh, as long as you're using the right kind of equipment, there's no issue whatsoever with leaving the tubes in the sockets, but by all means remove them if you feel more comfortable doing so, or if there's any risk that a tube could be damaged when the equipment is in a position that's you know not its normal operating position, because uh, again, the last thing we want to do is damage one of those tubes. All right, here we are looking at the bottom of the chassis on the ICO model 1030 regulated power supply. So I started with some basic cleanup on the power supply and I'll explain what I've done so far. So initially I used some compressed air and a light duty bristle brush and just worked through the chassis and cleaned out some dust and lint that was in there. And then I followed up with some Windex cleaner and those heavy duty blue shop towels. I just wiped the chassis down on the top and bottom and also on the front panel. So it's looking very good at this point. You can see the reflection in that chrome back here is really reflecting the components in there. It looks like a mirror. Now on the vacuum tubes, and this really goes for any vacuum tube you might come across, but you can see that white writing and also the writing over there, the 6L6GC. And the tubes get sort of a scum, kind of a buildup on them, and you want to clean that up. They look very, very nice when they're cleaned up, but you don't want to wipe through the writing or rub that writing, it can come right off of the tube and we want to preserve those initial markings that are on those tubes. So just be cautious around those tubes uh, when you're cleaning them. So now that the chassis is cleaned up and is looking very good, the next thing that I did was to uh, clean these various components in here, the potentiometers, and there's four of them, and also the slide switch. Now to clean those components, I used this CRC electronic cleaner and you can see it's plastic safe, so any cleaner that you use, you want to make sure that it's plastic safe uh, so that it's okay to use around the various components. Not all electrical cleaners are safe for use on plastic, so that's something to watch out for. Also, I should add that CRC is in no way a sponsor. It's just a product that I've found works very well and I've used it for many years. Now, when you're cleaning these potentiometers, you just want to work some of the cleaner down in that opening uh, between the back sort of housing that's on the potentiometer and the insulator where the terminals are connected. Put a paper towel around the potentiometer to catch the excess runoff, spray some of the cleaner in there, work the knob back and forth a number of times, let it dry, and then make sure to do it a second time to wash out any contaminants. Now these slide switches are notorious for bad connections. They're open on both sides. Debris can get in there over the years, some tarnish on the connections. So again, just some spray on the ends. Work that switch back and forth, and it's good as new, so working very well and uh, all cleaned up. Now, these toggle switches, I did not clean. They're sealed up. There's really no way to get a cleaner inside of them. There's no opening or hole or anything like that. And we know these switches did work from the initial test that we did on the power supply. Of course, the power switch functioned fine, and the other switch is for the regulated B plus output and it was of course functioning because we had the output on the power supply so no issues with that switch and uh, so just left those alone again there's really no way to get a cleaner inside those switches anyways 
So the next thing that we'll be doing is to replace these various electrolytic capacitors. Those capacitors have aged and are not reliable at this point, so I'll be changing all of those out. And again, we want to make this power supply as reliable as possible because it's going to be used on the workbench for future projects. So I want to be changing those out so we don't have a failure in the future. And these old electrolytics are just a failure waiting to happen at this point. Now we want to take a look at some of these resistors. These are all the uh, carbon composition type resistors. They're the squared off in Allen Bradley style. They're not the roundy style, which were again notorious for uh, drifting in value because they would absorb moisture. These typically are a little more stable, but they can drift in uh, their rating you know, over time. So we'll want to take a look at some of those and uh, make sure that they look okay. I really check all of them for that matter. There's a handful of them in here, but it's not an excessive amount. Now, if the power supply was stored in a very damp environment, it can really affect these carbon composition resistors. This power supply doesn't have evidence of being in a damp environment. I don't see excessive corrosion or anything like that on the chassis, but again, we'll want to check these and you know just see that they're uh, you know, measuring out okay. If they aren't or there's a problem, we'll go ahead and replace them. Now, you can see the size comparison on these resistors. These resistors right here and right here are two watt. I don't know if you can see, but right here there's a resistor that's a one watt, and the remainder of these are quarter watt. So when you're replacing these, that you can just tell by the physical size what the watt rating will be. When you replace these with a modern component that uh, is a two watt resistor, it'll often be smaller physically than this resistor. Perfectly fine, it's just the modern version. Um, but again, these old ones, these are two watts, one watt, and then these smaller ones are quarter watt. You can see a number of quarter watts over here as well. So let's start by taking a few uh, resistance measurements and see where we are on uh, the various resistors in here. We'll start with this one right here. This is a yellow violet orange, okay? Yellow violet orange is 47K. So over here on the meter, you can see the resistance will display. So let's take a look at that one. Yep, 47K, looking very good. So let's take a look at this resistor here. This is an orange, orange, red. I should also add that these resistors, you can see the majority of them have a silver band. A silver band is a 10% tolerance, okay? So this is an orange, orange, red. Orange, orange, red is 3.3K. So let's take a look at that. Mmm, that one's looking a little bit off. There's, it should be 3.3K, we're getting 3.9, it'd be almost 4K, 3.97, so... Eh, that one's drifted up, shifted a little bit in value on that one. There's another one next to it here, it's the same thing, orange, orange, red, okay? So orange, orange, red, again, should be a 3.3K. Let's take a look at that one. Okay, that one's right on, that looks very, very good. 3.359. Now, when you're taking these resistance measurements in the circuit, if there's a capacitor in the circuit, it can affect the value. Sometimes you'll see it shift a little bit, but uh, not seeing anything so far like that. It's we'll come across a couple here that have capacitors in the circuit, and we'll we'll see that effect. But uh, this next one is a brown, black, orange. That's a 10K, 10.6. So yeah, that's okay. That looks all right. Let's take a look at here. The, these two right here, these are the uh, equalizing resistors. They also act as a uh, bleeder resistor on these uh, capacitors, but they're also equalizing resistors. These two capacitors are connected in series. And they did that to uh, gain a higher voltage rating. Mm. So that one, hmm. It is dropping in value, but that's 3.3 megs, but it's falling, so we'll give it some time. So you can see how it's changing. That has to do with that capacitor in the circuit. It's affecting that reading, but that is really high, so that's interesting. That So that resistor is a yellow-violet-yellow, yellow, and yellow-violet-yellow yellow is 474K. You can see it's dropping way down now. So it's continuing to drop. We'll give it some time here. I, 
imagine that maybe something with those uh, capacitors charging, which is affecting the resistance reading. Now, since those capacitors are going to be changed out, I can check these uh, resistors out of circuit. And it's still falling. Hmm. That's 1.2 mega ohms, though, so that's very, very high. It's continuing to fall, but. Hmm. Well, we'll go ahead and check that one out of circuit. It will be easy to do because these capacitors are going to be removed. Maybe just the capacitor that's affecting that reading. This other one here next to it is the same thing. Same uh, color bands, same resistance value. It's also doing the same thing. It's starting up there at 3.3 megs and then dropping. So we'll, we'll check these two out of circuit once those capacitors are removed. Here's another one back here. Here's an orange, orange, orange. Okay, orange, orange, orange is 33K. So let's take a look at that. That looks very good. Some change there in that reading. That's probably another capacitor in that circuit, but very close there. So not looking too bad on that one. Here's a 1K, but this was a wire wound, the precision resistor. So let's take a look at that. That one looked very good. Uh, jumping around there with the test lead. There we go. 1.001K, so very good. Again, a 1% resistor. And this lead here, if I can get the probe on it there. That one's spot on, look at that, 1.000, so 1K, perfect. Make our way over here. I don't know if you can see in the camera, there's a resistor down here that's a red, red, orange, okay? Red, red, orange is 22K. Let's see what that one comes up as. It's a one watt 22K with a silver band. So 22K, yeah, that's not too bad. A little bit of fluctuation there again. That's probably because of a capacitor in that circuit. Settling off there a bit. That's very close. Now right here we have a brown, black, brown. And there's also another one here, a brown, black, brown. That's a 100 ohm. So very low resistance, 100 ohm. Let's take a look at that. Oh, my meter turned off here. Auto power off function. So 112 ohms, so that's not bad. That's okay. Here's another 100 ohm over here. 107, so nothing wrong with that. Now something I should add is that when you're testing these resistors in a tube uh, type device like this, it, you can do that because the vacuum tubes, when they're uh, not turned on, the various components in the vacuum tube, like the plate, the grid, and so on, the cathode, and etc. Uh, they act as an open circuit. Now, if you have a transistor with resistors around it, you cannot necessarily take a resistance reading in circuit because the transistor is really acts like two diodes back to back, and you'll get incorrect readings uh, even when the transistor is not powered up because of how the transistor works internally. So vacuum tubes are very different, and with vacuum tube circuitry like this, you can take these resistance readings in circuit and oftentimes get away with it because the tubes are all acting like open circuits on their various elements internally. So it's a nice little trick that you can do by uh, checking these components. You can also check some of the capacitors in circuit depending on what they're connected to. And also, of course, potentiometers and things like that. Uh, again, if you get a very, very different reading like we were getting over here, it may be due to something else affecting that reading. So uh, you know, you can disconnect it as needed, but oftentimes you can work your way through a majority of the components and take those readings right in circuit. So very handy way to uh, test and get a feel for the components and how things are, are working in here. Let's take a look back here. Here's a 400K resistor. Again, this was in the voltmeter circuit. So I'll go from here to right here. So that looks fine. Okay. Now actually when I Something is moving on this terminal here. And in here, wow, look at that. Let me zoom the camera in here. 
So we can get that a little bit closer over here. Looks like this terminal, and I'll move the camera up, pardon the shaking there. This terminal right here is, is loose on here. Okay, right, right in here where this resistor comes over to the switch right here. That connection down in there is, is moving on the, the terminal of the toggle switch. So if there's a broken solder or, an, you know, like an open connection right there. So that'll need to be taken care of. I'm actually surprised that would affect the voltmeter circuit. I'm surprised we weren't getting some intermittent voltmeter readings, but... Uh, actually looks like you really can't see it on the camera but it looks like they forgot to solder that because there's really no solder on that terminal right there there's a I believe a wire that's connecting to it the back side it looks like it has a little bit of solder but they've just taken the lead of this resistor and, and looped it around through there but there's no solder out here so uh, a little bit of an oversight during manufacture it looks like there all these years it's just been sitting in there and just a, an open connection waiting to happen. So that'll be an easy fix, but uh, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for in here. Any loose connections or problems like that, and we'll take care of them as we find them. So at this point, I'll get started with uh, replacing these capacitors. I'll also replace any of these resistors that are sh you know, drifting in value a little bit too much. Again, they're a 10% tolerance, so if these re you know, readings are outside that 10% range, those resistors really need to be replaced. So I'll continue with that, and when I make some progress on those component replacements, I'll be back and I'll share, you, share with you uh, what I've done. All right, I have the various capacitors and resistors replaced. You can see the original components over there. So there's still two resistors that need to be installed, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a moment. There's a 400K resistor that goes from this terminal right here with the red wire over to this switch's terminal. You recall this terminal had that poor solder connection that we saw earlier. There's also a 200K ohm resistor that attaches from this uh, terminal right here, the middle terminal on the potentiometer, which is the wiper, down to where this blue wire attaches on this tag board. Those two resistors are in the voltmeter circuit. So you can see the various electrolytic capacitors all installed very nicely down here in the chassis. They all fit really well. Most of those are very similar in size to these original capacitors over here. Now this orange capacitor right here has two capacitors in the one housing or can. The 20 microfarad 350 volt and then another 20 microfarad 350 volt. You can see the two positive terminals are brought out on this side, and a common negative. So this capacitor was originally installed like so, and it's been replaced with these two individual capacitors. The negatives come around here to this common terminal, and the two positives just come over to the tag board. So it's not unusual or uncommon to see these multi-section capacitors in this type of equipment, and when you come across them, you know, just install the uh, separate capacitors, perfectly fine to do so. Now over here we have the two capacitors that are the main filtering for the B plus supply and then these two resistors that are across those capacitors that act as bleeder resistors and also equalizing resistors. So let me grab the schematic. You can see here on the schematic the two resistors 470K actually they are 474K but they marked them as 470 right here. So they're in series, and when you have two equal resistors or equal value resistors in series, you'll drop the same voltage across each resistor. So we have 640 volts up here. This is a ground connection here. So we'll be dropping uh, 320 volts across each resistor. And these two capacitors are also in series, and when you have two capacitors of equal value in series, 80 microfarad, 80 microfarad, the total becomes 40 microfarads, but the voltage adds up. So we have 350 and 350. So we have 700 volts across here of, you know, a rating, so to speak, on a 640 volt circuit. So that's, of course, the reason that these are in series. And these resistors just help to keep the voltage across those capacitors equal. 
Now, if these resistors are not in, of equal value, the resistor that's higher will have more voltage drop across it. So let's take a look at the original resistors and what those readings actually are. So we have right here, look at these. Now you'll recall when I took a reading on these originally in the circuit, we had a very high resistance reading. These capacitors were affecting the reading on the meter, so once those capacitors were removed, I was able to take a reading on the resistors by themselves. So if we look at this resistor, we see 493K. All right, so on my meter it's 0.493 and then mega ohms, so that's equal to 493K, 493,000 ohms. All right, so that's actually shifted up a little bit higher than we would want to see anyways. This resistor, oops, bring that back over here. So that resistor is 475K. All right, so that resistor looks very good, but they're not equal in value so the resistor that's reading higher would, of course, drop more voltage across it. So those needed to be changed out. Now, the replacements are metal film, very high quality, uh, resistors with a better tolerance. These were 10% tolerant, so they may not have been exactly equal to start with. So once the power supply is turned on, we'll measure across both of these capacitors, and we'll see if the voltage is, in fact, equal. I expect it will be. The replacement capacitors right here are both rated 80 microfarad, but 450 volts. So we have an extra 100 volt rating on each of these capacitors. So this circuit is good for 900 volts on these capacitors. So well above the uh, voltage that we you know, can expect in the circuit. So let's take a look at these three resistors right here. We have these two, which are orange, orange, red. Okay, so orange, orange, red is a 3.3K. And then this is a 10K, which is brown, black, orange. So the, here's the two original resistors right here, orange, orange, red. You can see this resistor, 3.975, so almost 4K. So that one is drifted further off than we would want to see. So it needs to be replaced. This resistor right here is 3.3K, so very, very close, looking fine. Now. I replaced both of them because they share a common terminal and this one over here has a capacitor that was being replaced and so there was a lot of desoldering going on right here, a lot of heat being applied to components with very short leads on them. So why take a chance if this gets damaged with all that soldering and desoldering taking place and you know it's practically being removed anyways just from the work being done around it. So now is the time to change that. So the two new resistors are metal film with a gold band, which is a 5% tolerance, so very high quality, won't have any issues with those drifting over time. You can see these are uh, two watt rated. This original uh, carbon composition is also a two watt resistor. And you can see the size difference. The new ones are noticeably a little bit smaller in diameter, but that's just the uh, various types of resistors, carbon composition versus metal film. Let's take a look at this 10K resistor right here. It was replaced right here, this one. So you can see that one was rating 10.96, uh, reading 10.96 and just shy of 11K. So that had drifted in value a bit and needed to be replaced. So the two resistors that are in the voltmeter circuit that I mentioned that will be installed up here, one is a 400K and one is a 200K ohm. Now, the original resistor right here, we'll start with the 400K ohm. So this is a carbon film resistor, and you can see it says a 1%. I think the camera picked that up. So they were using a 1% resistor, 400K. The schematic mentions that it's a quarter watt for the rating and uh, I'll show you what my replacement is in just a moment. Because this resistor you can see is reading 410K ohm. So that's really shifted further off than just 1%. 1% of 400,000 is 4,000. So on the meter, 
if it was at uh, 4,000, if it had drifted up, you know, the, the maximum of 1%, we would see uh, on the meter we would, would be reading 0 0.404. So you can see it's reading higher than that. Now, with this reading uh, increasing, more voltage would drop across this resistor and the voltmeter would be reading a little bit low and it, you know, it's just going to be affecting the accuracy of that voltmeter. So the replacement resistor, let me get that right here. Here's the replacement you can see is a 400K. And let me see if I can get the tolerance to show on here. But that is a point 1% tolerance. So 0.1% tolerance, very, very precise resistor. We can see there on the meter, 0 0.400, so right on 400K. Now this replacement resistor is rated one watt. And the reason I went with a one watt resistor is because this resistor has a voltage rating, a maximum working voltage of 500 volts. So it's not often thought of about the voltage rating of a resistor, but just like capacitors, diodes, and other components that have maximum voltage ratings, resistors also have a maximum rating. Now it can be related to the breakdown voltage of the insulation. So let's say this resistor was next to a chassis, you know, like this, very close you would have a maximum rating so that you didn't have any arcing through the resistor, any type of a short circuit if it's touching something metallic next to it. But you also don't want the break, uh, the voltage to break down between the leads. Well, this is rated 500 volts. A voltage rating on a lower wattage resistor that I found was rated 300 volts. And this circuit will be up to 400 volts uh, because the power supply output can go up to all the way to 400. So we can expect a 400 volt drop across this resistor. So you would not want to use a resistor that was rated say 300 volts or even 200 volts, something like that. So the 500 volt rating is appropriate for this circuit. So to get that rating required a one watt resistor, at least for this series of resistor, this is made by Dale and it's their, uh, CMF60 series resistor. Now let's take a look at the other resistor here, the new one that is, let me grab that one right here, this is the 200K resistor. Now this resistor is 1% tolerance, so again the other was 0.1%, and this one is 1%, the original circuit calls for 1%. And we can see that one 200.2, so right on, no, no issues, and this of course being the new resistor. Here's the old 200K resistor. And we can see that one reads 203.3, .3, so it's also drifted up a bit in, in uh, value. Really more than you'd want to see, because again, 1% of 200,000 would be 2,000. So if it was at its maximum, it would be reading 202 on the meter. So it's already out of spec. So at this point, I'll get these new resistors installed in the voltmeter circuit, and then we will be ready to power up the power supply and see how it performs with the various components that have been changed in here. So I'll be back as soon as I get those resistors installed. All right, here we are looking at the bottom of the chassis on the ICO 1030 regulated power supply. So it's time to power up the power supply and try it out with the various components that have been replaced and changed out. So you can see the power supply is sitting on this its side on the chassis, so we have access into the bottom. I'll take a couple measurements uh, once the power supply is turned on. All the vacuum tubes are installed, so I can't have the power supply sit like it was before when I was working on it. So if you're following along and working on one of these power supplies, please know you do so at your own risk. There's high voltages throughout the entire chassis, really lethal voltages. There'd be no second chances if you were to touch the wrong component. So know the dangers and the risks involved and be, just be safe when working around this type of equipment. So again, you do so at your own risk. So the power supply is connected through an isolation transformer and my Variac, and it's also connected through that current limiting incandescent lamp. So when I initially power it up, the lamp will be in the circuit in series with the power supply. If everything looks good and the lamp remains relatively dim, 
then I'll switch the lamp out of the circuit and I'll apply full line voltage, 120 volts, to the power supply and then from there we'll test it out and uh, see how well it functions. All right, so I'm ready to power up the power supply, but first let me grab my digital multimeter. I'm just gonna set that up over here. I think you can see the screen there, it doesn't have too much glare on it. So, and I'm going to connect the negative test lead to the common point down here where the two capacitors join together, like that. And we'll be able to take a voltage reading on those capacitors as we power this up. All right. Okay. So power switch is on. Controls are at zero. And the isolation transformer and variac are now turned on. The incandescent lamp is in series, as I mentioned before. So I'm increasing the voltage, and right there we have that's 60 volts being applied. The lamp looks very dim, so that's a good sign. So we'll monitor the voltage on these two filter capacitors right here. So we do see starting to rise up a little bit there. As those tubes come into emission. All right, so that's looking good. That voltage is increasing. The lamp is remaining very dim. So I'll increase the voltage up to 80 volts. All right, so that's 80 volts right now through the current limiting lamp. It's remaining very dim, so that's good. So we have 166 volts, that's looking good. We have 165 over there, so that's looking very good. So the voltage is dividing equally across those two capacitors, that's important to see. So at this point I'll increase the voltage up to 120 volts through that current limiting lamp. All right, so that's set, the variac is now set to 120 volts. The lamp is a little bit brighter than it was, but not excessive, so we don't have any, uh, you know, excessive current draw. So we'll take another reading on these filter capacitors. So we see 240 volts, 239, almost 240 on that one. 239, all right, so that looks very good. So it looks like the power supply has powered up with no issues, and I'll go ahead and switch out the incandescent lamp so we'll apply the full 120 volt line voltage to the power supply. So the incandescent lamp is out of the circuit now. So on the front panel, if I increase this, yeah, that looks good. It is increasing the main output voltage when I turn that control. So we'll take a closer look at the settings and the controls on the front. I'll reposition it in a moment. We'll actually test out the power supply and connect some things, uh, test load and also a vacuum tube to the power supply. Let's take one last reading on these filter caps here. So we have 298 volts. And we have 298 volts. So that looks very good. No issues at all on that. Uh, again, it's important to see the voltage is dividing equally between those two filter capacitors. So I'll reposition the power supply and we'll take a look at the voltage uh, on the front panel terminals uh, for the main output and also for the bias voltage. And then I'll connect uh, a test setup with uh, a resistive load or dummy load on both outputs and we'll see how the power supply actually performs.
and then once we verify that the power supply is performing correctly, I'll hook up a vacuum tube and I'll demonstrate how to actually use the power supply to control a vacuum tube in basically a simple test circuit. So I'll be back as soon as I reposition the power supply. Okay, now that the power supply has been powered up, we want to check the voltage adjustment ranges and the meter accuracy on both the main B plus output and the bias voltage. So you can see I have the main B plus output connected to the digital multimeter. It's set for 200 volts, toggles between 199.9 and 200. And you can see right here, the meter is right on 200. So very accurate. That's looking very, very good at this point. Now this adjustment range over here when I turn this all the way down, when that falls to zero, it actually falls to a slight negative voltage. The two adjustments, as you recall, they're, they're on the chassis right behind the meter here. The one that's closest to the front sets that zero point, and the one a little bit further back sets the uh, full-scale 400 volt uh, adjustment point. And they're very touchy and they interact with each other. So when this is set down to zero, you can see we actually have a negative 0.2 volts. And a little bit there, it fluctuates slightly, but that's fine, not an issue at all. Uh, it's very, very close to zero. If you just nudge it one way or the other on the adjustment, that begins to go more negative, or it jumps up and goes to maybe like a tenth or 0.2 volts positive. So I want it to at least fall below the zero point, um, so this is perfectly fine. If we turn this adjustment all the way up to full scale, you can see we go to 400 volts and actually 401, so not a problem there. That looks very good. So I'll turn that back down, and I'll move the meter over to the bias adjustment. So I'll switch this over, so now the bias voltage, as you can see, is gonna be indicated over here. When the uh, selector switch here behind the meter is over on bias, this no longer indicates on the meter here. That back and let's get these test leads over here. So, all right. So let's take a quick look at the adjustment range here. So when that goes all the way over, 176. So no problems. They say zero to 150. I'm sure when that's loaded, that could pull that voltage down and we'll check that out here shortly. This is a two milliamp output, so very low current. Uh, bias circuits in tube uh, uh, circuitry, the bias uh, requirements are very low, very low current, so that's why that's only rated up to two milliamps max. So again, uh, from zero all the way up to the full scale, it's looking very good. There's no adjustment on this, like this adjustment over here, there, there's nothing to change on this, so. It's good to see that that's functioning correctly. Let's set that right to 100 volts. There's about 100 right there. Yep, that looks really good. So 100 is mid-scale. We're reading in the bottom over here where it's the red markings, and 100 is right there. So it's spot on, right on the tick mark for 100. So that's looking very good. So I'll get things set up now with a test load on the power supply, and let's see how it functions with an actual load, and we'll check the uh, current meter over here, DC milliamp meter, and we'll compare that to the digital multimeter and make sure that it's also accurate. So I'll be back as soon as I get that set up. All right, I have the power supply's bias output connected to this test load. This is a 47k ohm resistor. So a little bit of a jumble right here in test leads and meters, and I'll explain what's going on. So this meter over here is just monitoring the voltage that's on the bias terminals. So as I increase this adjustment, we'll see this voltage come up. You also see the voltage over here rise up. This DC milliamp meter does not function for the bias output, so there'll be no indication on this meter. Now, we want to measure and monitor uh, for smaller voltage changes than what we would be able to see on this meter, and that's why I have this meter connected, and you'll see that in just a moment. This meter is measuring the current that's flowing through this resistor. So the path for the connection is from the positive terminal right here, okay, through this loop around through the resistor, through this lead right here, which comes over to the meter's uh, input right here on the current setting, out through the common 
and then this common connection loops around through this connection right here and then ultimately around through this test lead and then back to the negative connection over here. So this, is, this meter is just in series with this resistor. It's just, again, measuring current. Now you'll see over here, this is on the microamp scale. Since this is a two milliamp maximum, two milliamps is equal to 2,000 microamps. So when this reads 2,000 over here, that would be equivalent to the maximum output that the power supply can provide. I want the microamp scale so that we can see uh, a very fine or small increment uh, changes in the current. If I use the milliamp scale right here, it just doesn't give as much resolution. So I'll, power supply is already turned on. I'll go ahead and increase this. And we can see already we have an increase in current. A little over 600 microamps right there. I'll bring it up to 1,000 microamps, okay? Which would be equivalent to one milliamp. So we're right about there. Okay, so that adjusts very easily. So we have a thousand microamps over here. So we have a thousand microamps or one milliamp flowing through this 47k ohm resistor. And over here we can see 47.28 volts. All right, and over here on the meter, that first tick mark would be 50. So it's just slightly under, and that makes sense for 47, you know, 47.29, very close to 50 volts. So the bias uh, output has no issues, you know, supplying current and the voltage. Now, the specification for the power supply indicates that if the line voltage drops 10 volts or increases 10 volts, this should not change more than a half a volt, all right? So right now we have 120 volts being applied to the power supply. There's no current limiting or anything like that. It's just right off the isolation transformer and through the variac to set that voltage. It's set exactly 120 volts. So I'll go ahead and lower the variac down to 110, all right? Okay, so there's 110 volts being applied right now. And you can see there is basically no change on the output. So that looks very, very good. The current is holding very constant. Voltage remains, of course, very constant as well. I'll go back up now. It's 120 volts, and now I'll go up to 130. Okay, so there's 130. We see very, very little change over there. Almost no change whatsoever over there. So again, well within spec. No issues at all for the regulation on the bias output. So that's looking good. I'll go back to 120 volts AC input right there. So that's 120 volts being applied to the power supply. We'll just go ahead and increase this. Let's go to the full rated current. So we'll go all the way up here to 2000 microamps or two milliamps. And it's coming up right about there. Pretty close right there. Jumped over a little bit. We don't want to go over. Call that good right there. So that's 2001 microamps. You can see on the meter if that's set right there, that would be 2.01 milliamps. A little more resolution like that. And over here we have the voltage is 94.5. All right, so 94 and a half volts coming out of the bias supply. So it has no issue supplying its full rated current. So that looks very good. I'll go ahead and lower that voltage down again. So this is 110 volts now. I've dropped from 120 down to 110. And it's looking very, very constant. Almost no change, just, just ever so slight there. But so it has no issue, you know, maintaining the output with a full load on the, uh, or full rated current load on the output for the bias side. So looks looks very good. There's 120 volts being applied again, so back up to the normal input voltage. All right, so that is looking really good on the bias voltage. Let me move the test over to the main B plus or the main regulated output. It'll be a similar setup as what we're doing here, but I need to change that resistor to a different value, and I'll be back as soon as I have that uh, set up.
All right, I now have the test set up connected to the terminals on this side, which is the main output or regulated B plus voltage. And I'll explain what's going on with this tangle of test leads that I have set up here. So this digital multimeter is again measuring voltage and it's connected across these terminals. All right, so this meter and this meter should measure the same or read the same. We'll be reading the top scale on this meter because the selector switch is now on the regulated voltage position. So it's zero to 400. This is a 3000 ohm resistor and it's the test load or dummy load across these terminals. Now this meter over here is measuring the current through this resistor. So this positive terminal, this test lead comes over here to this resistor, through the resistor, out over here to the meter, through the meter, and then through the test lead, and then back to this negative terminal right here. Now this is in the milliamp scale, not microamps that I had before, because immediately the current will be higher. We don't want to be in the microamp range. So I'll start with 100 volts, all right? So we'll switch this on, and we'll increase the voltage. So we have right there, there's 99, go back down just a little bit. It's very close right there, Let's see if I can nudge that down just a little bit more. That's very close, 100.1 right there, that looks good. So over here, we see this is right on 100, so that looks good. And then the current we see over here is 33.83 milliamps. So very reasonable, just using Ohm's law, if you have 100 volts across a 3000 ohm resistor, you could expect to have 33.33 milliamps, that would be the ideal amount. Slight variation, I'm sure, in that resistance, and you end up with 33.83, but very, very close, so that's fine. The reading on this uh, DC milliamp meter over here looks very good as well. It goes 0, 50, 100, 150, and 200 milliamps. And then the next uh, tick marks that are a little bit more uh, marked in bold are 10 milliamps. So we have 10, 20, 30, 40, and then 50. So again, 33, and it's just a touch above the 30 right there. So that looks fine. All right. So I'll increase this now to 200 volts. All right, that looks very close there. So we have 200.3. So we're right at 200, so that looks very good. And then we have 67.6 milliamps. Again, just using Ohm's law, 200 volts across a 3000 ohm resistor would be 66.66 milliamps. That would be the ideal, so 67, very reasonable over there. All right. And let's go ahead and increase this up to 300 volts. All right, so 299, very close to 300. And we see 100 milliamps, so that's right on where it should be, 100.9, very close. Again, 300 volts across a 3000 ohm resistor would ideally be 100 milliamps, so Looking very good. All right, so I'll bring this down to 100 milliamps again, or excuse me, 100 volts. Okay, 100 volts. So we have 100 volts there. Reading 100 volts, and we're back to 33 milliamps. And I'll increase and I'll decrease the line voltage, and we wanna make sure that this doesn't change by any more than a half a volt with this load connected as it is. So right now we're at 120 volts, input to the power supply. I'll drop that down to 110. All right, so that's 110. And we can see that's remaining very constant, so that looks good. All right. Okay, so I'll increase that. Now that's back up to 120. And now we'll go to 130. Okay, so there's 130. So that's looking very constant. It's right on, holding at 100 volts right there. So continues to be 33 milliamps, of course, over there. So that looks very good. So I'll bring that back down to 120 volts. All right, 
I'm just using the variac to change that line voltage. All right, so that's right on 120 now. Okay. Now I'll increase this up here to 200 volts. So right there, let's see if I can get that right at 200. Very close right there. 200.5, that's perfectly fine. So now what we want to take a look at is when the power supply has a load as it is right now, we have 67 milliamps. When we disconnect that load and then reconnect it, how much does the output voltage fluctuate? So basically going from a no load to a load or from a load connect condition down to no load. And we don't want to see an excessive fluctuation on here. And in fact, I have the spec sheet. It looks like they're calling for load regulation would be 0.3 volts. And that's up to 100 milliamps. So we're under the 100 milliamps. So they don't want to see anything more than uh, 0.3. Yep, looks like 0.3 volts. All right. So to make that easy, let me see if I can get this down here. Make it right at 200. Let's see if I can do that first of all. It's very touchy there. Just try and get that right. Very very close there. We'll call that good. That's 199.9. Okay. So come in here and we'll disconnect like so. All right. So we can see we have 200.3 and no current is now flowing. All right. So it's disconnected. I reconnect that. And we go to 199.9. All right, so that looks very good. So again, with the current flowing, 67 milliamps, 199.9 volts, disconnect it, 200.2 with no load. All right, so that's looking very good. The, the power supply is able to regulate well from a no load condition to a load and then taking the load back off again. All right, the final thing that I'll do is to connect a vacuum tube to this power supply. And I'll show you how to do that next. We'll use the bias voltage to control the grid on the vacuum tube, and we'll see the effect that that has. So let me get things changed around, and I'll be back as soon as that is set up. All right, here we are looking at the front of the ICO 1030 regulated power supply with a vacuum tube connected. So this is a very simple circuit, but it'll demonstrate how this power supply can be used to control a vacuum tube and the effects that these controls have on that tube when it's operating. So this power supply could be connected to much more complex tube circuitry in say an audio amplifier or something like that. But for this demonstration, just a very simple circuit with one tube and this resistor right here, which I'll explain in just a moment. So the tube is a 6AS7 and the 6AS7 has two triode sections internally. We're only using one of those sections for this test. And then the tube is, of course, in a socket. It's an octal tube. It has the socket, and it's just mounted on those blocks of wood to support it. So the tube needs several different voltages, which this power supply provides. So we have the bias voltage, which is uh, applied to the grid. We have the filament voltage, which, of course, is applied to the filament. You can see it glowing in there. You're actually seeing the cathode structure glow. The filament is inside the cathode. And then we have the regulated B plus output voltage, which is adjustable, which is connected through this resistor and then to the plate of the vacuum tube. So this DC milliamp meter right here is monitoring the current on these terminals. So that's effectively showing us the current through this resistor and then through the, the vacuum tube itself. It's important that the vacuum tube plate current is not exceeded. So when you have a test setup like this, you want to monitor the current very closely. Now the current flow through the tube will be affected by this bias voltage, and we'll see that now. Incidentally, the, volt, the value of this resistor, 4,000 ohms, it's just a resistor I had on hand, but it's appropriate for this uh, circuit. Um, this triode and the amount of current that it can handle works well with that 4,000 ohm resistor. 
in a circuit like an amplifier or something like that, the plate uh, circuit needs to have resistance, but it may be the resistance of the windings on a transformer, for example. You always need some form of resistance in the plate circuit. Sometimes you'll also have some resistance in the cathode part of the circuit, but that gets more advanced and that's not applicable to this. That has to do with biasing and some other techniques. So I'll turn the power supply output on, all right? And I'll increase the output voltage up to 100 volts. All right, so that's very close to 100 volts right there. And then I'll switch this over now the bias voltage is down to zero, but I'll switch this over. So now this meter is reading the bias voltage, and the bias voltage is a negative voltage with respect to the positive voltage that's being applied to the plate. So as the grid of the vacuum tube is made more and more negative, the tube will conduct less and less. So right now there's no uh, bias voltage whatsoever on this connection. We can see that's at zero. But the tube is conducting. If you put no voltage on the grid, the tube will conduct to some degree. And we can see that over here. The current has come up just a little bit. So that's the current that's going through this tube right now, and also, of course, through that resistor. Now, as I increase the bias voltage, again, it's becoming more and more negative on the grid. You can see the DC milliamp meter falling to zero, all right? It's basically at zero right there. Okay, so that dropped down. So over here, we can see the bias voltage is just a little over 50 volts, uh, about 60 volts, I would say, about 60 volts. Okay, now if we come back over to the regulated voltage and we increase this further, I'll go to 150. All right. And remember, as this goes between the two positions, we're reading the different scales. The top scale is for this regulated voltage, and the lower scale in red is for the bias voltage. But as I increase this to 150 volts, you can see I didn't touch the bias uh, voltage, but we now have some current flowing again. You can see this has come up just a little bit off of zero, and that's an effect that a tube will have. As the plate voltage changes and the bias is held constant, the current through the tube will, of course, change. So you can see that has happened here. If I take the bias voltage, oh, move that back over again. So now we're reading bias voltage here. This current right here, to make it fall to zero again, the, the uh, grid needs to be made more negative than it was previously. So right about there. So that's back to zero, and you can see over here, we're just under 100 volts, all right? So just under 100 volts. So if I lower the bias voltage down, okay, you can see the voltmeter on the right is falling to zero. So this is back to zero. We have no bias voltage. We're still at 150 volts on the plate. And you can see that the current has come back up again. If I change the bias voltage and just rotate this control back and forth, like so, you can see the fluctuation in the current that's flowing through that resistor and, and through the plate. So that demonstrates how a vacuum tube actually functions as the grid voltage is changed. So if this was an amplifier, you would have a, a signal coming in on the grid and you would take uh, the signal out off of the plate resistor and you would find a larger signal on the plate circuit uh, on this resistor than you have going in on the grid. Of course, that gets into a more advanced topic. That's something that we could do in a future video. In fact, if you're interested in something like that and seeing that demonstration, please mention it in the comments. Um, I always read the comments, so uh, if you're interested in seeing something like that, let me know and I'll try and do that in a future video. So that simple circuit uh, set up here demonstrates how the vacuum tube functions and how the power supply is able to control it. So the last thing to do is to put the power supply back in its housing or the case. So I'll do that next. You can't really see the way the camera is angled right now, but I don't have the power supply actually in its uh, housing or outside case. So I'll go ahead and get it reinstalled and uh, the power supply will be ready to put into service. So the restoration 
Repairs and testing on the ICO 1030 regulated power supply are now complete. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel, now would be a good time to do so. So until next time, goodbye.